Hey folks that have just arrived, if you're interested in winning an HP Slate, a 10 inch tablet that's running Android, uh, what you have to do is come over here and get yourself a ticket. And At the end of the uh, first series of lightning talks, we're gonna do the draw, and then after the next uh, eight talks, we'll do the, the final draw, and then I'll encourage you all to go down to the booth and get some free champagne and cheese. So if you haven't got a ticket, please come up and uh, I'll help you there. Um, and we're gonna start right now with a great talk from the very infamous Monty Taylor. And here you go. You have five oh, I have. Oh, that's exciting. Well, I'm not up to the podium yet, so that's uh, a little bit um, I'm at a disadvantage. Um, so, uh, so hi, I'm Monty, and I'm not going to talk about myself so much because I only have five minutes, and it's impossible for me to do anything, uh, even a single slide, in less than five minutes. So, I'm going to talk about the library OS client config. It's about making uh, OpenStack more usability-ish. Um, so the problem is, is that I, I have a ton of cloud accounts. Uh, Infra has five. Uh, it has control plane, node pool, in three different Rackspace regions, a control plane, node pool, and HP. I have two personal and HP, one in Rackspace, and two internal HP cloud accounts. That's 12 OpenStack cloud regions. Uh, how do I connect to them? It's giant pain in the ass. So uh, I could do this. If I wanted to get a list of servers on one of them, I could type out all of these things on the command line. Uh, open stack, blah, 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 server list. That would be terrible. Um, so it's, it's in fact extremely silly to connect to your cloud that way. Um, I can set environment variables. This is an improvement over putting them all into the list because I can just source an, uh, a file with environment variables in it uh, and then I can just operate things uh, naturally. Um, but then I wind up with 12 shell script snippet files uh, in my thing and I have to source the right one before I do the right task and then sometimes I connect to the wrong cloud. Um, and that's, uh, if some of them are my personal ones and some of them are in for production, uh, that might be a problem. Um, so uh, uh, the other problem with this is that the environment variable processing is, is actually implemented in OpenStack in the command line tools, not in the client library. So if you're programming in Python and you want to use the client library, the environment variables aren't actually processed by the client library and you have to do all that environment variable processing yourself. Um, if you actually want to check just in the Python libra client libraries we produce, you will find that in fact we copy the exact same set of environment variable processing code to all of our client libraries. So in fact in this case, just looking at those, there's 13 different instances of add op option or argument os-username. Uh, and that's uh, also in and of itself uh, kind of stupid. Um, there's also pre-existing knowledge you need about your cloud. You have to know the auth URL. That's fair. Like it's actually fair for you to have to know the auth URL, possibly your username and password. Um, it's okay. Uh, but there's other things you need to pre-know. You need to know the Glance API version that Yacht Cloud is running. It is not possible to find out from your cloud what Glance API version it is using. You have to know. Uh, there's other things like the fact that Rackspace doesn't put the Swift URL properly in their keystone, or the fact that HP's DNS service, even though it's designated, is listed as HPEXT colon DNS. These are things you have to know about your cloud in advance to be able to use it. Um, so I wrote a library uh, because I didn't like any of those things that I just said. Um, it essentially does this. It processes in this order a file in a couple of different locations called clouds.yaml that is a YAML file including, you guessed it, all of your clouds. Uh, it also processes the, the standard OpenStack environment variables uh, and then finally it can filter through an arg parse uh, an arg parse namespace to be able to uh, inject all of the right things. So it will do the thing it is that you expect it to do with all of the data that you're going to give it at the time that you expect it to do all of those things with all that data. Um, and it's a library so you can use it. Uh, it also contains inside of itself uh, some vendor defaults and it's more than welcome to uh, accept patches for your cloud's vendor defaults that aren't otherwise included in the Keystone catalog uh, of, your, of your thing. So if you need to know that Rackspace's image API version is two, uh, which otherwise there's no way of knowing because of insanity, and I'm going to kill JPipes for that later. Um, you can do that. You can also have the fact that uh, that's Rackspace's auth URL and that's HP's auth URL. I don't need that in all of my config files. Uh, it's just HP's auth URL, uh, and that's fine. So this is my cloud uh, YAML uh, or a cloud YAML that is um, that is redacted. So you can see I can I can express the. Uh, that's actually there's a bug in that. Uh, 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 that, that's actually my password, but shh, don't tell Jim, he's in the back of the room. Um, so I can, I, can refer to, I can refer to the HP cloud there, or that, the second one should say auth URL, not cloud. Uh, uh, and I can, I can give it various different things. I can also give it some region, a list of region names so that I, I can tell, these are the regions in this cloud that I'm using, uh, and, and it, can, it can construct the appropriate constructors for me uh, for a Python thing. This allows me to reference named clouds. So I can say something like OpenStack cloud equals Mortred, 
uh, server list, and that will do the right things to, to operate on that cloud. Uh, I can also add that we've added the one uh, environment variable OS cloud, so if I want to reference that, I can do that. Now, if you've only got one cloud, that's fine. Uh, there's, a, there's a default cloud called OpenStack uh, that you can use if you just have the one OpenStack cloud that things will default to uh, if, if you, don't, you don't actually have to reference it by name, because uh, it's just the, the default. So where is it in use? I wrote this library called Shade, which I'm not going to talk about right now, uh, but it's in use in there. Uh, that library is in use in Ansible, or there's some patches to, to land there. So it's sort of in use in Ansible as well. Uh, and there's a patch in flight from Dean to use this in Python OpenStack client. Um, I kind of would love to, to land it on all of the Python star client uh, things because it allows us to delete some code. And it's also a very small library that I'm pretty sure is done. Uh, it needs no new features. <laughs> it needs no new functionality. It should have a very, very, uh, other than landing uh, potentially vendor defaults. Um, there's another thing that it does that I don't think is on this thing. Uh, you can actually drop, um, if, you're a, if you're a deployer who's, or, or a vendor who's deploying things, uh, it does allow for dropping in uh, vendor cloud.yaml files on a, in, in an Etsy on the, on the host. And so if you want to define other clouds that aren't something that would be in there, but you want accessible on all of the, all of the machines that, that your customers are using, uh, you can sort of do that in a, in a vendor type of way. Uh, and here's where you can get it. You can get it from git.openstack.org slack forge uh, os dash client config. Uh, it's also published on PyPy, uh, PyPy uh, os client config. And that is amazingly uh, five minutes. Say when? Okay. Hi, my name is Michael. I'm here to talk about Storyboard. For those of you who don't know what Storyboard is all about, Storyboard is task tracking for interdependent projects. Um, why does it exist? It exists to track work, exi exists to integrate with infra, and exists to replace Launchpad. <laughs> Woo! Well, why are we replacing Launchpad? Well, have you ever tried to use Blueprints? Actually, have you ever tried to use Launchpad? Um, uh, it has poor reporting capabilities. Uh, its API kind of sucks. It is open source because we have, as of yet, not had anybody be successful at standing up Launchpad on their own. Uh, Jim will confirm that for me. And at the moment, um, engineers working on Storyboard, well, that got messed up. The number of engineers working on Storyboard is larger than the number of engineers working on Launchpad, which is one. Um, not anymore. Not anymore? You actually have somebody working on it? Oh, excellent. So it's, it's larger. Excellent. Um, so what is Storyboard actually? Uh, Storyboard is an API, which is written in Python with Pecan and WSME and also and other OpenStack things. It's also a web client written in JavaScript with, you know, Angular and Bootstrap and lots of other open source things. Um, and what can it do? Well, you can create a story which lots of tasks that can each be assigned to different projects. So you've got that whole multiple project thing going on, um, which can be put into project groups. And you can search on all these things, and if you're super ambitious, you can even write plugins for it. Ooh, right? So let's actually take a look at what that looks like. So uh, here I am. I'm going to go ahead and create a new story, and I'm creating a new story. Hey, look at that. Um, it's a really neat story. You'll see the first task has been auto-filled, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, fill that in. And I'm going to say that's part of storyboard, and this also requires some work on Zool, I think is what I'm saying there. There we go. And this requires some work on Puppet Storyboard, I suppose, right? And there you click Save, and boom, you have yourself a new story with a little bit of history. Um, similar searching, uh, so let's say I want to go and I want to search for something like things in Storyboard that are merged, that are assigned to me. There you go, so you've got sort of a, a quick breakdown tag based uh, way of searching various little things. Now what will it do? Um, it'll manage releases, that, that's an upcoming feature. Um, it will manage security bugs, it will report progress um, on, on a macro scale, and it will federate, which means that you can run Storyboard inside of your own organization and slurp down the OpenStack stuff and manage your own project sort of um, on top of uh, what's happening upstream. Um, so when is it coming? Well, uh, it's ready more or less now for Infra. Um, we're planning on discussing whether or not Infra is ready at the Infra meeting at um, Thursday at 3.30. Um, 
Stackforge, Stackforge, we're planning on being ready by next summit, um, and we've already got a whole line of early adopters lined up. Um, OpenStack, we are hoping to be ready by next year, which means that chances are you will be using Storyboard by this time next year. Um, I know, right? And uh, th that goes out to you hidden influencers out there. If you don't want somebody walking in and redefining your software development process for you, now's the time to get involved because we have, we're making the decisions on prioritization, on workflows and all that stuff right now. So like, now's the time to start talking to us. Um, now the question is, can you avoid it? Well, um, it's been approved by the foundation, in particular by Mr. Thierry, who's sitting in the back right there. Uh, so it might be kind of difficult to avoid it, although you could st uh, uh, stick your head in the sand. Um, or you could collaborate. Well, what do you do about it? Oh my god, you run. No, wait, no, wait, no. Um, you contribute. Uh, but how do you contribute? Well, you can sign up for one of my UX sessions on Wednesday. I've got a, a clipboard right there, so talk to me after, and I will sign you up. Um, you can start using it. Um, it lives at uh, storyboard.openstack.org. Um, you can contribute resources. Now, resources can be you are an, uh, a hidden influencer and you assign some members of your team to it, or you can code on it yourself, or I desperately need some UX work. I would love some assistance with that. Um, and uh, you could also do some process and product design and actually engage with us on the overall design of Storyboard as a whole. Thank you very much. Excellent. <laughs> Hi. I so should probably actually. Did you send me this? Uh, I did. There, I saw. Oh, yeah, I, I saw know. Did yours? So, are you go to the VMware when there's still VMware. Is that it? Yeah. So I know it's Windows. So uh, go back to Explorer, or whatever it's called. Explorer? Oh, this thing. The yeah, and then click VMware. Uh, the oh, aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here you go. Push F5. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is not really. Just push F5. Well, now it's white. It just takes can, a second. Can you guys figure out a way to open you're good, you're good. a better method? Ah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Colette. Oh, good. Someone's got a timer for me. Um, my name's Colette. I'm a little bit jet lagged. Uh, and I work for Monty Taylor at Hewlett Packard on a team, team that we call the Flying Circus. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story about us. Um, our mission? We make OpenStack better, and we make HP better at OpenStack. A long time ago, in a galaxy far away, otherwise known as early 2012, Monty was hired by HP along with two other people, and his entire goal was to work on OpenStack upstream. Uh, by 2013, his team had grown to about eight people, and they decided that they were going to have some needs for some sort of management-y kind of style things, and somebody read the Valve Handbook, for those of you who are not familiar with the Valve Handbook, I highly suggest that you go Google it if you have not seen it. Uh, two important points about Valve. One, Valve is a gaming company and it has a completely flat structure. Um, so there are no technical managers at Valve. The secondary part of that is that, sorry, is that uh, everyone at Valve works on what they want to work on. There's no command and control structure for organizing who does what work. Uh, people work on what they want to work on, and if they don't want to work on it, they don't work on it. Um, so around about May 2014, we had expanded to about 35 people on the team. And what we were noticing and hearing from people who were joining our team as new members was that they were having difficulty onboarding. We could get them their laptops, we could get them their oath keys, we could get them the technical things they needed, but they still were having trouble adjusting, and it was taking them quite a lot of time to figure out how they were supposed to do work. We were throwing them, oh, go read the Valve handbook, and they were like, but we're not Valve, this is HP, and we're working on OpenStack. So in keeping with the Valve tradition, I stood up and said, why don't we just make our own handbook, you guys? Um, so that's what I did. Uh, we needed to talk about culture. 
And we also needed to kind of do some tips and tricks for new people. I wanted to make it practical, but I also wanted to make it something that we as a team could rally around. And a lot of people talk about culture. There was actually a lot of mention in, on culture earlier this morning in the keynotes. Um, this is my example for all of you on where culture is the road that the rubber of process meets in OpenStack, right? Uh, submit code, review code, disagree, debate, socialize and drink, rinse and repeat. There's an element of this that is not unlike any other open source movement, but culture is this thing that we all agree upon that we never talk about with each other. And it's not until you're kind of inducted into the secret society of the group culture that you're in that you understand what you're supposed to do. And what I was trying to do is help people who'd never experienced that before know that it was okay to disagree and to debate and to bring up questions. Um, so that's just one example. Uh, basically how this worked, was I did interviews with everyone on our team, almost everyone. Most of those interviews were one-on-one. -on -one. They lasted anywhere between 40 minutes to two hours. Some people have a lot to say, it turns out, on culture. Um, this was the general outline of the questions that I asked every single person on the team. I wanna really focus on the values and behaviors here, and then we did come up with our mission that I, I spoke about earlier also during this. Um, the, the guide itself, I'm not gonna take you through, it's way too long. Um, but the main important points were the values and behaviors that came out of that. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about where you might be able to see that guide um, when I take you through these values and behaviors. So, uh-oh, yeah. Okay, first one, trust. Without trust, we have nothing else. No other values can exist, and we don't have anything to base our work on. Um, we trust each person on our team to demonstrate our values, to do work that matters, and to support one another as a team. We regularly practice this trust with everyone around us, even those who aren't familiar with our group and the way it works. Openness, and openness related, importantly, to communication as well as to uh, software. Bravery, um, we ask difficult questions. Self-motivation, uh, we're curious and constantly learning. And again, we're, we tackle the projects we're interested in when we're interested in tackling them. And empowerment, we are heavy on mentoring and championing developer-driven workflows everywhere we go. So just to wrap it up, um, our mission again, we make OpenStack better and we make HP better at OpenStack. And what's next? Thanks. Uh, so well, did, uh, does anybody need a ticket to enter for a slate 10? It's going to be a very short talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, does Enter work on this the same as Max? We'll find out, I guess. Um, hi, my name is Duncan. I'm CEO of CloudSoft. Uh, disclaimer, I am a user of cloud, perhaps an abuser of cloud. Anyway, I'm here to talk about Clocker, which is a new open source project we just started, otherwise known as the Docker Cloud Maker. So it's probably not the final frontier, but if you're familiar with Docker, anybody, know, anybody not know what Docker is? Good, okay, I can skip the Docker thing. So one of the things that the Docker guys said uh, around June this year was that 
orchestration was maybe not the final, but certainly the next frontier or challenge for the Docker community. And so as, as a member of that community, we've tackled that. We've tackled that with an open source project called Clocker. I'll give you all the links at the end, and obviously you can take copies of these slides, whatever. Um, so what does Clocker do? It helps you spin up and manage Docker clouds. Now, it does this on any cloud or, in fact, any infrastructure. So it's not specific to OpenStack. Uh, we'll get into how it does that in a minute. Having spun up a cloud, it then serves up containers. So containers become the lingua franca once you have one of these clouds in place. So what is Clocker? Well, it's both a Apache Brooklyn application or blueprint. So here we can actually say, I would like a new cloud, please. Uh, I'll specify a location. I'm going to actually land it on Softlayer Amsterdam, give it a name, and then give it a location. So it's a Brooklyn application. It's also a Brooklyn location. So application and location. So it's an application because it creates a cloud. But then once I've got it, I want to use it. Well, I can use it with any blueprint that I would normally use within Brooklyn itself. So here I just say location my Amsterdam Docker cloud. Who started it? I didn't start it. Disclaimer, I am the CEO. I have some very bright guys on my team. This is Andrew Kennedy. He started the, the, the uh, project and is still the, the lead on this project. He'll be at ApacheCon and DockerCon in Europe talking about it. What is it made of? Well, I've already hinted that it's made of a number of other open source projects, notably Apache Brooklyn. So Apache Brooklyn is something we created a few years ago and is now an incubator project within Apache Software Foundation. So that lets you model, deploy, and then manage applications. So as I said before, a Docker cloud is just a glorified application. We use JClouds. I'm sure you're all familiar with JClouds. Um, JClouds not only is used generically by Brooklyn in order to deploy two specific clouds, but it's also got a Docker driver, so we can talk to a Docker engine using it. <clears throat> it uses Docker. Well, that would be, be kind of dumb if it didn't. And finally, it uses a new a new project called Weave, which I'd recommend you take a look at. This is by the founders of uh, RabbitMQ, Alexis Richardson and Matthias Radu. They've started a new project and a new company around that project called Weave. The company's called Zetio. So what does it look like? Well, here's one I made earlier. This is just a snapshot, I'm afraid. This is looking at a, a cloud that we set up in Amsterdam. This is me now deploying an Elastic Web app, a simple three-tier app. And normally, I would be deploying that to a a public cloud or some other piece of infrastructure, but here you can see I'm actually deploying it to my Docker cloud. If you don't believe me, here's another screenshot. Obviously, screenshots can be fabricated. Um, um, and finally, I look at the, it from the point of view of the Elastic Web App, and it's up and running. So it's up and running in a cloud that didn't exist until I actually created the cloud itself. Small print. Clocker is open source, Apache license still in beta. You can find it on Brooklyn Central on GitHub. Apache Open Source, donated to the Apache Software Foundation, started by another member of our team, Alex Henneveld. JClouds, I'm sure you all know Adrian Cole. If you don't, you should. But uh, the guy I'd like to call out here is Andrea Turley, who's also on our team, who wrote the, the Docker driver. Finally, Weave, links there. So in summary, Brooklyn allows you to spin up a, a Docker cloud on any infrastructure and then use it, target it, take any blueprints you've already got, or ones you want to create and deploy them to it. Web resources there. This is me. And all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So let's go and party or listen to more talks. Marcelo? No. Um, do you have your presentation? Did you send it to me? Yes. OK. Hopefully. Thank you. Hello, and my name is Marcelo. Uh, I am an OpenStack ambassador, and also am one of uh, leader group in OpenStack Brazil. I would like to speak about uh, the OpenStack in Brazil, uh, vision of Brazil about use OpenStack to create compute clouds. So Brazil has over 200 million people, and has the seventh largest economy in the world. So. There are opportunities, uh, great opportunities for growth in local data centers. 
uh, our research from Coppermine with IT Executives Organization Brazil show that a uh, growth of cloud services in next two years, great opportunity for cloud services and uh, preference for private and hybrid clouds. The companies in Brazil want the security for information, so is a, a good opportunity for private clouds. So how is the OpenStack in Brazil? Uh, two large prov uh, providers are offering cloud-based OpenStack. Government of Brazil has officially backed the creation of services using OpenStack also. So uh, university helping in the development of OpenStack, highlighting to University of Campina Grande with research projects. The university has contributed with uh, over 8,000 uh, lines of coding, other projects of OpenStack. So we have uh, our group. Our group was uh, created in, in 2011, 20, and uh, our group uh, has more than uh, f uh, 400 people. Only in <coughs> this year, uh, great more than 50 percent, and uh, this year. We had the uh, four meetups and another schedule to occur after the summit. So f uh, only in the, the two years ago, uh, we grew about 75% uh, for, for us is, is very good. Some thoughts uh, of uh, events in Brazil. This is a picture from OpenStack at the International uh, Software uh, in Brazil. This is a picture from OpenStack birthday for butter. It's a, a very nice cake of OpenStack. This is another picture, another picture of birthday. This is a picture from DualTech OpenStack meeting. Uh, there are more than 500 people in the, the meeting. It's, it's very good. This is a picture from, from above in the FutureCon. FutureCon is a congress and business trade uh, in Sao Paulo, Brazil, with uh, business companies. So what is the key challenges and opportunities for the next two years in Brazil? More use case of OpenStack Brazil. We need more use case. Uh, we need more telcos offering cloud service based in open, OpenStack. We need increase by 100% of our group members. We want uh, group. We need more partnerships with universities and with more developers. And, and also we need more speakers and sponsors for meetups in, in Brazil. So, merci. My name is, is Marcelo and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. So the folks that are over here that are, are probably standing and, and starting to get fatigued from standing because standing is difficult. There's lots of great chairs over here. If you guys want to take a seat, your choice. But there's tons of seats over there. There's tons of seats. So and for the folks that just joined us, if you're interested in having a chance to win an HP Slate, it's a 10-inch tablet that runs Android, uh, raise your hand and we'll bring you a ticket to enter. And uh, so if you're interested, it's a 10-inch tablet runs Android, and if you are interested in participating, we're going to do the draw at the end of uh, the lightning talks here and in the middle of the lightning talks. So just raise your hand, keep them up until you get a ticket, and that's going to enter you into a chance to win the, the, the tablet. So next we have Yolanda, who's going to come up and uh, speak with us. Hello, uh, my name is Yolanda. I work for HP uh, as a software engineer. Uh, <laughs> I work for a team that is called Gozer, and in our team, <laughs> in our team, we are using uh, the OpenStack CI project to run internal HP projects. For example, we are running HP Helion for it. 
So first of all, well, you may know what's OpenStack CI. Let me show you that a bit. Uh, it's an integrated collection of developer tooling and automation, and it's used by OpenStack, but you can run it for your, I mean, for your main projects. Uh, it's based on three premises. Uh, everything in the code must be reviewed, every change that you do it. If the change is not tested, it's just broken. So every code, every change you do, everything is, uh, is really simple. It needs to be tested all the time. And you need to automate everything. So any build, any mirror, any publish, you need to create tools to automate it. It's supported by OpenStack community. It's used there. And it allows uh, all developers there to have their code tested, reviewed, and merged automatically. Okay, so let me show you a bit of our workflow. We are using Git to do all the changes there. We are using a tool that is called Git Review, that it's a wrapper for Git, that instead of doing a push of the code to the, to the repo, is sending the changes to Gerrit. Gerrit is our code review system. It exposes your changes there, and allows your peers to review it, to flag it, and approve or deny it. We are using Jenkins to run all the tests and all the jobs there. And in the meantime, we have Zool. Uh, Zool is the, the connector between Gerrit and Jenkins. So every event that happens into Gerrit, it triggers uh, an event and tells Jenkins to run this test. Jenkins is providing feedback to Gerrit to allow the code to be reviewed. Then it also, Zool is allowing to, to do the code merges and is pushing the changes to Gerrit, uh, to Git, to our mirrors. That's pretty basic, our workflow. So, what are the OpenStack CI main, main advantages? Uh, it's a quite reliable system. We have been using that in production for over two years. We have been running lots, thousands of tests. It's a very flexible system. You can, we are using that for OpenStack projects, but you can use it for everything, for different languages, for example, Java. You can run different types of, different types of platforms, different types of tests. If the scales, we are, due to our demand, uh, we can add nodes or decrease nodes depending on the, on the loads of the servers. It handles parallel testing. So Zool is available to run tests in parallel so you get your test results faster. And it can be managed by a small group of people because it's a fairly automated tool. Oh. So it's still, well, it's a, a very used tool. We rely on it, but it still has areas of improvement to where you can work on it. First of all, uh, the isolation of projects needs to be improved. Initially, it was used by OpenStack, but it's used now for other platforms. So there is a, there is a continuous work to, to split uh, the project configuration and the, uh, the CI system as well. The initial deployment and learning curve can be a bit complicated, so uh, we need to be working on improving that all the time. We are doing it. Uh, also, for example, as we are using it in HP, we need to have synchronization capabilities between upstream and downstream. And we need also to automate all the relationships and be between all the, all the projects. Uh, NHP is working actively on it. Uh, we are providing people, full-time employees, to the OpenStack CI project. There is the OpenStack Infra PTL that belongs to HP as well. And, well, there is Jim Blair. And we are encouraging people uh, to use OpenStack CI system and embrace all the capabilities that it has and start using it and realize the power that it has. So, uh, if you, well, my name is Yolanda Robla. You can contact me at this, this email if you, you want it. You can also take a look at the documentation there. And we also have a, a channel in Freenode where all people are, are there and all we want to help. And if you want to know more, uh, we'll be later at the OpenStack Expert Bar. So you can go there and join us. I will be glad to, to ask any question. Thank you so much, Yolanda. Thank you. Thank you, Yolanda. So does anybody need a ticket? I can't do it on there. Yeah, they mute it in there. So once they realize I'm talking because they see the, the meter, they'll turn it on, which is, which is nice of them because I probably am over here bumping it and making lots of noise. So uh, next we have Ricardo. So he's going to come up and uh, just uh, raise your hand if you haven't got a ticket to enter the for the slate, which is a 10-inch tablet. So if you don't have a ticket yet and you'd like to, to uh, have a chance to win, 
There's a, after Ricardo, there's one more lightning talk before we're going to do the draw for the first one, and then we're going to have a few more lightning talks and draw for a second one. And if you already have a ticket, the draw is good for both. That's not mine. <laughs> I swear. Oh, by the way, you have to be present to win the draw. So. Present. That's the right? Hello everyone, my name is Ricardo Carrillo Cruz. I work as a cloud automation engineer at HP. I work with the Holanda. Uh, our team is responsible for managing a CI and CD infrastructure that is based on OpenStack CI. This is the same infrastructure that is used to build Helion and other HP cloud products like CSA or cloud system. OpenStack CI is not just about building OpenStack itself or just for building Python-based projects. It can also be used to build Java complex projects. Um, we were approached at some point by other HP Cloud teams that they were running their own CI systems and they asked us if they could migrate their Java builds into our systems. We didn't have any Java capabilities by the time, so we gathered the requirements and we came up with a list. We wanted to have an open source artifact repository with a strong community support. And for this, we chose Sonatype Nexus. We also needed multi-tenant isolation for artifacts and repositories and groups URLs. So what we did is we gave dedicated folders into our Nexus the storage system to each team. And we enforced them to prevent their team names or their project names into their URLs to prevent name clashing. Due to the complexity of building those products, the system also needed to support Maven multi-module projects, to support multiple artifacts generation per project, and to support different settings XML values per project. After working on some prototypes, we came up with a final implementation that follows this workflow. Whoa. So a, a Java developer pushes a change to our system and it gets into the check queue. It goes through the check jobs, it gets a plus one, and eventually a, a core reviewer approves the change and then the change gets into the gate queue. Then it runs the gate jobs, uh, if everything is fine, it merges into the git repository and then the change enters the post queue. Here we, um, we run uh, two different jobs. A post Maven build job that what it does it, it generates, it builds a project with Maven and it uploads the artifacts to our Tarbo server. Chained to this job, we have a project build and Tarbo, uh, the post Nexus deploy job that what it does, it downloads the previously uploaded artifacts into the slave workspace and then it, it uploads those artifacts into the Nexus. For our implementation, we based uh, what we had, what they had in AppStream with the Maven plugin job templates. So the idea was to split the build and Nexus deploy into steps. In the first step, you build the project with Maven and deploy it to a local repo in the slave workspace. And then you upload that local repo folder structure to our Tarbo server. Then, in the second step, we download that local repo folder structure into the privileged slave workspace. We iterate through that folder structure, uh, uploading every single artifact we find on every Palm XML, and then we trigger a Maven metadata rebuild API call in to our Nexus. And that was it. I want to emphasize the fact that OpenStack CI can be used to pretty much every project. It's not just OpenStack, not just Python, also Java, you name it. These slides are available on my uh, GitHub, 
uh, you can also find the link to the upstream chain for this work. You can contact me via email, Twitter, on IRC. I'm also on OpenStack Infra. And nevertheless, I'll be around all this week. So I will be more than happy to chat with you about this or anything that is related to OpenStack CI. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Ricardo. So the, we're going to have one more lightning talk before we do the draw for the slate. So just a quick reminder, for the slate, you have to get a ticket. You keep the ticket that we give you, and then you have to be here while we do the draw. We're going to do a second draw at the end of the, all the lightning talks before we go for the, the pub crawl. And the ticket you have now is good for that opportunity as well. So next, we're going to welcome up James, and he's going to give uh, his quick f five minute talk. And then uh, we'll get to the giving this away. All right, hi. So my name is James Polly. I'm a AAA developer for HP. I'm part of Monty's Flying Circus, which you've already heard a bit about. Um, I work from, based in Sydney, Australia. Um, I theoretically work from home, but actually I like to change you know, my environment a fair bit. So often you'll find me working from a cafe or from a library or from a park tethered to my mobile. So when I started working on AAA, I started running through the AAA tools. And I noticed it was spending a lot of time building disk images. And I noticed a lot of the time building disk images was spent downloading stuff from the internet. And this worried me because I thought if it's going to be doing all of this downloading every time I run, I'm going to be stuck to my desk because mobile data is expensive and slow. So I was looking for ways to try to make sure that my image builds were as low bandwidth as possible. So this lightning talk is a very, very fast, quick overview of some stuff that I've done to make stuff a bit less network intensive on my laptop. Why do you care? You probably aren't crazy enough to be doing these builds on your laptop. You probably have a machine in a data center which probably has a decent bandwidth connection to it. So why do you care about low bandwidth image builds? Um, in short, speed. You probably want to build your images as fast as possible especially if you've got them, if you're doing the builds as part of a CI chain where you want to give feedback to developers, or if you're doing the builds in response to a customer request where they want their instance up and running as fast as possible. No one likes sitting there staring at a data center, at a progress bar. Data centers are pretty boring as well. Um, so what are the things Disk Image Builder downloads? Well. It needs a base operating system to start with, so it's going to be grabbing a cloud image from your operating system provider. Those are around 250 to 300 megs usually, maybe bigger. Um, it's going to probably need to install some OpenStack tools. If it's, say, doing a Git clone of Nova to get Nova, that's around 200 meg again. Um, Neutron's about 100 meg. Usually those tools will have some Python dependencies as well. So you're installing a bunch of Python packages. Um, usually you want, say, Apache or MySQL or something, so you'll be installing operating system packages. Um, it's all a bunch of stuff that needs to be downloaded. So what can you do to minimize how much uh, Disk Image Builder is pulling down from the cloud? Well, the good news is it's mostly done by Disk Image Builder itself. Um, most of the elements in Disk Image Builder that pull these things down. We'll cache them on disk. And obviously, the first time you run it, there's a lot of downloading. Second time, it mostly it can find what's in the cache, check the internet to see if there's a fresh copy to pull down. Um, but if not, it will just use what has already got cached. You can even pass the dash dash offline flag, which makes Disk Image Builder run almost entirely offline. It doesn't even look for freshness. It just uses what you've already got cached. So that's the end of my talk, right? Well, no. For one thing, in the real world, in a data center, you probably don't just have one machine running Disk Image Builder in one place. You've probably got multiple machines. If each of them has their own cache, they're probably going to get out of sync over time. And so depending on the same config can build a different image depending on which machine it gets run on. 
that's not something you want. Um, even in my case, running it on a laptop, there's no point building an image unless you use it. So at some point, you're going to be running a VM. That VM is going to be doing stuff, and some of that stuff might involve downloading more Python packages or operating system packages. So what can you do to get better caching, less bandwidth, and a cache that's consistent across machines? Well, the obvious answer is use Squid. Squid actually does a decent job, because most of this stuff is downloaded over HTTP. But there's a few things Squid can't handle. By default, it doesn't handle very large files. We've got a config as part of our triple O docs that helps to fix that. It can't handle stuff that is downloaded of HTTPS because it can't see what it's downloading. So it's a good start. It doesn't do everything. I've also been running uh, mirrors of the operating system package repos on my laptop. They're large, about 70 to 100 gig. Um, but it means that if you've got a VM up and running and it needs to install a package, you've already got it on your laptop. Um, I also try to mirror the entire PyPI index. Again, this is about 100 gigs, so it's a lot of disk space that I'm chewing up here. But it means I don't need much bandwidth when I'm building images. That is time up. You can find me on hash to on Freenode or email me there. We're going to have some more great lightning talks. Um, so we got uh, John Dickinson actually is going to be up next. And he's going to talk about some Swift things, maybe. Who knows? It might be typical of the Swift PTL to talk about Swift. But it could be about anything. I don't know. I didn't actually take time to review any of the talks before I accepted them. It's actually not true. A lot of folks did a lot of preparation here. So big round of applause for all of the presenters so far, please. All right, so Monty's going to pick a number. We're going to read it out. And if you have the number, you get to win this. Who's going to pay me something good? All right, this one. If you, uh, yeah, so it, it should be zero, eight. Oh, God. I'm pretty sure you could hear me before this, but uh, zero, eight, three, five, seven, nine, seven. Wrong number again. Yay! Who are you? I'm Jim Baker, <laughs> and Jim. and I know some of you guys here. Um, yeah. You have to HP to win. You're not HP, right? I am not HP. Right. I work at Rexpace. Yay. All right, so we got some pictures. All right, thanks. thanks. So next we have John Dickinson. Then we're gonna have Clint Byram. Then we're gonna have Marie Paul. Uh, some, we're gonna talk about some network virtualization, functional virtualization. We're gonna talk about some Swift stuff, and uh, so stick around for folks that didn't win a tablet. There's going to be a second draw at the end of the uh, this session, so if you get a ticket, feel free to stick around. You're going to have another opportunity to win a tablet. Yeah, yeah. 
It's okay. Thank you. You gotta, you I know. I, I appreciate it. That's why I love you, Monty. So we could talk about uh, the fact that, let's see, hmm, what are we going to talk about? Not that. Oh, what are you, oh, okay. That's yours. Spirits. That's what I like to talk about. Yeah? Let's talk about, yeah. Yeah. Like cows and healers. Yeah. Did I take you? I didn't take you to the medical place, did I? You were there. No. Yeah. yeah, there's a really great place down uh, on the lower and the lower east side uh, called Casa um, Mescal. So as yeah. you might imagine, they have an excellent Mescal selection. Nice. A couple months ago, two, three months ago. Oh, yeah, Illegal Mezcal. Nice. Uh, the uh, Once months ago in San Francisco, there was a Mezcal tasting event. They just kind of got about two dozen different people in there to taste things. Couldn't buy bottles there, unfortunately. But it was all like these tiny, tiny production guys yeah. uh, that are just, just trying to get started. And they're like, you can't, why can't we buy anything? We have like three dollars. <laughs> they've got like a barrel or something. Yeah, they're like they're like way, way so early in the it's like it's like, yeah, this is what your tequila looked like you know, your mezcal looked like uh three months ago, you know, when it was first harvested. Yeah. It's like the third world most third world picture ever in the world, you know, like mud huts and these clay brown pots, this nice stack stills. It's just like, whoa, that's crazy. I'm waiting on you, Cody. But he's not. I even use my. Uh, <laughs> I've got the timer. I got the timer. Okay. Cool. Thanks. All right. Thanks everybody for showing up for the lightning talks. We just had a, a great round of lightning talks from Monty, Michael, Colette, and a bunch of other folks. We're going to continue with uh, a number of other folks that have great things to say. And so before we really get into it, though, uh, if you're interested, you can have a chance to win an HP Slate. It's a 10-inch tablet that runs the Android operating system. And all you have to do to win is be here at the end of the lightning sessions and also, very importantly, get one of these tickets. So if you do not have a ticket yet, please raise your hand and somebody will be nice enough to bring you some tickets. Here, Lisa. <laughs> Raise your hand if you want a, a ticket. This is the tablet right here. It's a 10 inch tablet, runs Android. So, just a quick review you have to be here, you have to get a ticket, and there's two tickets over here. here. Three more. All right, take it away, John. Hi, my name is John. I'm the Swift uh, PTL, and I want to talk to you about temporary URLs. Being only five minutes long, uh, I figured temporary URLs as in a short-term URL is a good thing to talk about. So, why do we need these things? The problem is, is that auth is a bear. And why, why is it so painful? Uh, well, because from the docs, here's an example of a short token from Keystone. <laughs> Just type it in. It works with curl. So here's the problem with that. Uh, another problem with uh, using auth systems is that you've got to talk to an external system that's on the other side of the network, which leads to latency and lots of congestion and cache issues, like what happens when you expire it and how do you propagate that sort of thing. It's painful. Um, and you combine that with what Swift is. Swift stores a lot of data. 
Um, actually, it stores a whole lot of data. And if you start trying to manage this with uh, remote connections and they're hard to cache and everything, you get problems. Um, and so it's worse than that because every piece of data can be accessed at any time by anyone. And even more than that, oftentimes the data is going to be accessed by someone who's not even really the owner of the data. An example of that is Wikipedia. Any image that comes off of that comes off of their own Swift cluster. You're certainly not the, Im the owners of that image. So I know, let's use ACLs. Uh, those are container level in Swift, and they're complicated to manage because you're going to have to have every single user needs to be put in some kind of group and given permission. And it just adds to a whole lot of complexity, and you don't know which way you're going, and it's crazy. So in other words, to sum up, auth is a bear. So we need to solve this. I know, let's not use auth. auth. But that just puts the bear in the cage, and that's sad, and it doesn't really solve the problem. And you don't want to put the bear in the cage. You want to let him roam free. So we could just make the, the auth system faster. <laughs> And this is a joke. We could have Keystone Light Light, and that's a joke for people who've been around uh, OpenStack long enough. So I think we need to do something different. And what we need is something that allows you to sign your requests, and uh, that's what tempor temporals do. It gives you a uh, HMAC SHA-1 of your request into Swift, and you can do it on a per-object basis. And the really cool thing is that you can do that with no you can do it locally. You don't have to have any sort of net connection at all um, to either generate or to validate it. And the URLs are time limited. So that means you can say this is going to be something that is only valid for the next so many seconds or minutes or hours or days or whatever you want. And the great thing about that is you can do common things like let's prevent hot linking and maybe say when I download a web page uh, with the content served out of Swift, the content's only going to be good for a few seconds. Um, so they can load it on the page, but nobody's going to be able to remote uh, link to it. Uh, you can hand them out like candy because they're free to need, they're very, very cheap to create. Um, so you can give them out to anybody who wants to or, or not. You maybe, maybe don't like candy. Um, and then another thing is that you have multiple keys that you are signing with, which means that you don't have to worry, you don't have to stress about swapping them out. You can rotate your keys over time, which means that uh, you don't have to worry about breaking existing URLs. You've got this nice, you can rotate the keys and uh, keep the ones that are in the wild out there for good. Um, uh, without breaking them. What this, and also they're very, very fast because it's, they are locally done on the Swift proxy servers, which means they are horizontally scalable and you can keep just adding more proxy servers just like normal and it's simple just HMAC math on the CPU. It's not some uh, expensive complicated things. You might say that they are Swift. So to sum up, use temporals. They're awesome. Thank you very much. So, um, I've said this a lot today, but <laughs> if you haven't got a ticket yet, please raise your hand. You have an opportunity to win a 10-inch slate. So, for folks that are joining, if you'd like to win a slate, raise your hand, and we'll bring you a ticket. <laughs> All right, next we have Clint Byram. So, give it up for Clint. All right, how's everybody doing? <sighs> All right, that's Monday. I'm going to ask you guys again on Friday. We'll see how that goes. All right, so I'm here to talk about, uh, about change, uh, because change is hard. Uh, it's funny, I, I actually heard the exact opposite assertion in one of the keynotes this morning, and uh, I cackled. So <laughs> change is one of the hardest things that we do in OpenStack. Uh, my example here is the Jenga blocks, right? Uh, if, if you've ever stacked up Jenga to start, that's, that's obvious, right? We all know how Jenga looks when it's done. Three, three, three. Anybody, uh, you know, a four-year-old can get Jenga started. All right. What's hard is changing it because every change that you introduce introduces entropy, and this is difficult. OpenStack has real problems with change, and we've all seen it, right? Upgrades. Everybody is asserting, "I've got this Havana. I've got this Grizzly. I've got something more ancient than that," and it's hard. And we discovered that while we were developing Helion, we want to be able to upgrade it just, even just patches, just to be able to, to, to deliver new software that might change the database, might need new objects in the message queue. This is hard stuff. Another thing is timing matters. If you just try to run everything whenever you want to, now really fantastic software handles this great, but you know, sometimes the squirrel's in the way, you need to wait. So 
that's that's my paradigm for locking. And and, and we tried to do this with heat, and we failed. Uh, heat has the ability to do this, but expressing it becomes very verbose. And so we thought of a new way to get it, because the the problem is this. Heat allows you to express this graph. This is this is a nice representation of, of what you do in heat. You say, oh, I, I'm going to give you some user config uh, and some database details, and you're going to create me servers. And then from those servers are more servers and monitoring. And, and then I'm going to feed that all into some software deployment that's going to go and do stuff inside those servers. It's really fantastic for building the Django blocks, because you know exactly the end state, and you know each step to get there. All right. That, and what heat does with that, it turns it into a workflow. So inside heat, it goes, oh, OK, first I need to read the user config, store the result in heat. Everything's ready. I'm going to make some more servers. This is all very simple workflow stuff. And I can forget about how this workflow works when I'm using heat, which is fantastic. All right? Well, what if I just want to change that server? I just need to upgrade that server. What kind of server it is, is it, matters. What's the state of the other servers? Matters. The timing matters. And the change is difficult. And heat has some, some great hooks for doing stuff like this but it gets more and more and more complex. And in fact, what I can do is just instead use Ansible and assert a workflow. So in Ansible, Ansible is a sequential workflow tool. So while heat is, is describing the end state and finding a way to get there, Ansible is actually defining all the steps that you might, we want to take. And it does it in a very nice, succinct way. And it does it agentless. It does it over SSH. And it's, it's actually turned into a very pleasurable experience instead of trying to express this all in heat with, with, without actual workflow control. So this workflow on the left, there's a few pieces of it here uh, expressed in YAML in, in Ansible. So the result of that was instead of uh, having to write uh, probably about 15 times more heat, we were able to boil that down into just a single Ansible playbook that takes you from Helion 1.0 to 1.0.1, which will be released soon. And going from there, the, the workflow becomes introspectable, and you can understand it. And when it breaks, which is probably most of the time, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> uh, you can actually debug it, and you can know, and you can retry pieces of that. All these things are very, very difficult with declarative systems because they try to genericize problems, whereas in Ansible, it's actually just trying to let you get past the problems and, and work around them. So where do we go from here? Uh, now that we've brought Ansible in, uh, we, we put that up on StackForge. And uh, I'm inviting more uh, Triple O contributors to, to take a look and, and, and participate in that. We're also trying to invite more Ansible people in to, to take a look. Uh, I know there's several vendors out there that build their clouds using Ansible. And uh, so the, the, the next thing is you know, just make the party grow a little bigger right now. It's just a couple of us uh, you know, at HP and, and uh, inside the Triple O project looking at this. Uh, but I'd like, to, I'd like it to grow. I'd like to see if we could stand up, build the Jenga blocks. Uh, you know, w without even necessarily doing as much on heat and do all the software stuff in Ansible just so that we can reuse all that stuff. Um, there's other things that we, we've been thinking about. Uh, we could probably, uh, oh, we don't have a REST API for Ansible. That's one real difficult thing. So uh, Tusker in Triple O is an e a UI for it, and we need one, so we're trying to build a REST API. That's all I have. Please come to our session at 4.30 tomorrow, or Wednesday, in Gauguin if you want to talk about it more. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Clint. Uh, so next we have uh, Marie. Paul. OK. So let's see. So five minutes, it's short, especially to talk about NLV. So who knows already about NLV, Network Function Virtualization? Oh, actually, who doesn't know? <laughs> That's easier. OK, so a few of you don't know about it. So I hope I can uh, stick to the five minutes. <laughs> so first of all, NLV stands for Network Function Virtualization, and it's about telecom networks. So everybody knows about telecom networks. You have mobile phones. You have uh, internet at home. Uh, you know that enterprise, they also need to have connections, uh, and so on. 
And so the big thing about the telecom networks is that until you know very recently they were very static. I mean they are asking HP to support you know hardware for uh, tens of years and so on, not to change the software for 20 years, and it's been a very static and conservative uh, world. Except that these you know, years with over-the-top services and so on, they are losing money and they are being challenged you know, very much and so there is a revolution happening and it's virtualization. They need more agility and so on. So you've heard about NAV in the keynotes, which was a big surprise to me because we were starting to try to talk to the open source community for a you know, few months, almost a year now, uh, <coughs> coming from the telecom world and the standards and so on. But you know, we are two different worlds. I mean, in the telecom world, everything is standardized, it's regulated, it takes you know, two years to set up a standard and so on, so it's quite rigid. In the open source community, somebody you know, sends some code, it's reviewed, it's, you know, it goes and, and so on, it's very agile. And so it's, it's, you know, we are trying to learn how to talk to each other. So just to give you a, a brief overview of what's going on, this is what has been specified in the Etsy um, NFV, so Network Function Virtualization, to represent a kind of functional um, architecture of what a telecom network could become, you know, if it was virtualized. And uh, when we talk about virtualization of telecom networks, it's not just cloud, you, I mean, it's not just, you know, using OpenStack in the cloud. It's really virtualizing everything from the set -up box in your house to the firewall, NAT, and routers in the enterprise, the core network, the base stations, it's everything. And so it's spread across you know, countries, across uh, different operators, and it's to deliver services that are you know, across all these different geographies and service providers. So what you see here, I'm trying to maybe clarify a bit the things, here is your network function virtualization infrastructure. So that's your hardware. Uh, compute storage networking that's the virtualization layer and it could be anything but for the time being we talk a lot about hypervisor and then you have the virtual resources this virtualized infrastructure is being managed and you have something that we call the vim the virtualized infrastructure manager for you it's like openstack this is where we put openstack and then on top of that we have the virtual network functions that's all the functions that the telecom operators need to run the network so it can be a set-up box, it can be a base station, it can be an IMS core, it can be you know, anything that is in the network. And these functions, if they are virtualized, they become virtualized network functions, they are being managed by a VNF manager. And so these things normally they come from uh, the equipment providers. So the Ericsson that you heard this morning, the Huawei and so on, it happens that HP provides some of that. In my organization, which is CMS, Communication Media Solutions, we provide some of these VNF functions like home locations and so on. And then on top of that, because telecom operators, they not only need to deploy these functions on the network, but they need to stitch these functions to build services and then stitch these functions with other functions from other service providers and so on to build end-to-end -end services. There is an orchestrator. So in this design, what we um, define is an orchestrator that would be on each network operator's uh, network to deploy the functions and then stitch the services and then you know, define these end-to-end -end services, but also to talk to the other orchestrator from the other service providers and so on. And then on top of that, you have all the support systems from the operators to create you know, the, their own services that they need to sell and so on, but also to allow enterprise to build their own services on demand, to allow end user, you know, um, residential customers like yourself to you know, also uh, subscribe to new services, define new services, change services, and so on. So all these systems need to be uh, updated uh, kind of real time sometimes. And there's you know, a whole bunch of requirements which appear as we dig into you know, this virtualization of the telecom networks. So let me figure out how this works. So what we have done is we have uh, defined a number of use cases um, and there are like nine of them and then we looked into uh, you know, what was specific uh, in terms of requirements uh, for OpenStack for instance. And uh, we have a number of, of these requirements which have started to be listed. You will recognize some of them. Some of them already showing in uh, Juno and, uh, 
and in kilo you know, projects and so on. And HP is also very actively working on that. So you know about Helion. I mean, some of you are working on Helion. And what we are doing is that Thank we you. have announced. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have announced uh, today. Uh, you read on the on the news. <laughs> Thank Helion you so much. Carrier grade for telcos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie. <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, network virtualization, function virtualization is, is very neat. So if you is there any more opportunities more? to hear about it this week? Yeah, not much, actually. We kind of missed the opportunity to get speaking slots um, in the OpenStack Summit. Next year, we'll do better. So I will be at the bar if you have questions. <laughs> 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 All right, next. All right, we have, uh, I don't want to butcher your name, Surem, or I think we, we have another name for you, Cloud Don. So Cloud Don's going to come up and he's going to give his presentation. And while he's doing that, I want to tell you really quickly that once we're done here, we're going to have this draw real quick. And then we're going to head down to the booth. And we have eight PTL members that are going to be staffing as experts, as well as five members of the technical committee and one member of the board of directors. So lots of really uh, folks that are really involved with OpenStack community. They're the experts. And they're going to be there to answer any questions that you might have or just if you want to chat and have some champagne. And at the HP booth. So it's right outside of the... Aud big auditorium, please. Thanks, Cody. Thanks, everybody. I just realized that I didn't put my name on that. Um, my <laughs> Sri Ram Subramanian, AKA Cloud Don. Maybe it's good because you'll remember me as a man with black hat, Cloud Don. I'm here to present a Stack Accelerator, an accelerator for OpenStack startups. Where do we stand with startups now? We are at an inflection point. Uh, we are more than 40 years old now. We have seen s scores of startups. Some of them had good exits. We have seen a lot of funding activity in the past three years, and uh, it's in a, it, it also like we are seeing a lot of customer adoption these days, and uh, any more startups coming in may have a less work in selling OpenStack, because one of the study you can see um, is projecting the entire OpenStack market to be more than $3 billion by 2018, and we see larger and larger adoptions uh, and more, more coming. The first way of startups kind of solve the infrastructure problem and uh, they've been working mostly around distributions or, or different service models, but primarily around support. But what is lacking here is not just for the startups, getting the, product, getting the code in into this open source, into this humongous code base is difficult. We have heard scary stories of code reviews waiting for more than two weeks, more than two months, I'm sorry. And uh, we've also had very less success with the different kind of business model. Maybe we have had one business model around support, not more than that. We need to fix that. We need to be able to support more startups, navigate this system, navigate this open source, try to get their product out better, and also fine tune their business model. Also, this is the right time for more innovation coming in. We have the first way of startups focusing on infrastructure, mostly on infrastructure, but a lot of stuff needs to be done. For instance, automation, for more, more DevOps, uh, try, try ambitious projects, try disruptive thing, uh, put in containers in, uh, as a first-class citizen in op OpenStack. Some of it, which the bigger vendors might be scared to do, startups will be able to do it. But they need help. Sorry, page down. So that's where Staxelator comes in. Staxelator is a network of uh, mentors who, who are very strong open source, uh, open stack con code contributors and also open source business experts. They'll be able to provide with um, mentorship and guidance in getting your code out, getting the startups code out. They'll be able to fine tune your business model and all the more important, Staxelator will, will provide investor access for startups. How we are doing that? Staxelator operates in three different models, on-prem, hosted, and distributed. Hosted is like on-site, at Stack Accelerator or Incubator's uh, workspace, shared workspace, select startups will be working for a period of three months, working uh, on, on, on their respective uh, code development. Stack Accelerator's mentors will be able to provide hands-on guidance, mentoring over a period of three months. Uh, it, they, Stack Accelerator will also provide 20K of seed funding in exchange of 6% of equity. On-prem is some like a large player like HP would be hosting these startups on their premises. These hosts will not get any equity in, in exchange, but they'll be able to have say in the product itself, start, startup's product itself. They will also have the first access or first right to acquire or invest on the graduating startups. Startups will get resources both from the hosting uh, company and also Stack Accelerator's list of mentors. They also get a, a, an excess of 6% of equity. The distributor is, is finally like, it's a global model. Startups will stay in their respective workplaces. 
Again, for three months, Stack, uh, Stack will be able to provide guidance over remotely for exchange of 3%. So essentially, like Stack Accelerator will be able to provide mentoring and guidance for accelerating your product development by guidance, in, guidance and mentoring on code development and business models. If you are interested in either being a mentor or, providing invest, or being an investor, please sign up at signup.staxelator.com. If you are a startup, please, oops, I'm going page up, sorry. If you, if you are a startup, please apply at signup.staxelator.com. Thank you. All right, great, thanks so much. So next we have Rick coming up. And uh, does anybody need some tickets to win a tablet? Raise your hand if you, HP doesn't qualify. HP people, if you want a tablet, you're gonna have to go out and buy it yourself. No. Ready? Hi, I'm Rick. Uh, my uh, IRC handle is Rev. You can also reach me at rev at hp.com. Page down. So I'm here to talk about containers. And uh, the definition I found about containers is containers are an implementation of operating system level virtualization. I started this talk several months ago because I noticed a certain bigotry against containers by the virtualization establishment. Um, so I'm here to put containers in context and maybe alleviate some of that, that bigotry, or at least explain it, put it in context, as it were. So let's talk a little bit about containers. Containers started off, uh, as far as I can tell, with something called jails. Jails were introduced in about 2000 for FreeBSD. Basically, they used Cheroot to assign processes uh, uh, access to the file system and, and isolate, isolate the processes that way. Uh, Sun followed on with their zones implementation in about 2005. Again, a derivative deriv derivation on a different operating system. And then likewise, Linux developed containers called Linux containers or LXC and uh, roughly released that in 2008. Along came another company. They made something called LMCT5, which stands for let me contain that for you. And this company uses um, containers to deploy, a, if not all of their software, a large section of their software on this cloud thing. This company is called Google. <laughs> and then they open sourced LTCM5, LMT, LMCT5, in around 2013. You're probably more familiar with Docker. And Docker really is an, oh, and by the way, uh, Google's um, LMCT5 is based on LCX, as is Docker. Docker is also basically a derivation of LCTX. Actually, it's not a derivation, it's an improvement on LCTX. I'm, I'm sorry, LXC. Um, and it's uh, basically they made it easier to use and manage containers. That's really their, their secret sauce. So let's talk a little bit of history about virtualization. Why are containers, why do some people don't think containers are virtualization. Well, to understand that, we have to understand what virtualization is. And again, this is kind of a naive history, but I only have five minutes. Um, but before we talk about virtualization, we need to have a brief history of multiprocessing. <clears throat> so multiprocessing, back in the day, some of us would take a deck of program cards that we've typed in, hand them to a guy behind the, the door. He would then load them into the computer and our program would run. The next person would load in those programs and the next program would run. Then, that's one program at a time, then Moore's Law happened and it turns out we can load many programs into memory at once. So what we needed was a system to suspend the running program and then unsuspend one of the suspended programs and this is what multiprocessing basically is. <laughs> multiprocessing uses, um, or the the, the scheduler is based in the kernel. The kernel does many things, but one of its main things it does is it schedules the processes to run in time. 
and then your applications or your services run in user space. Kernel space is protected. Um, it's the very basics of the operating system, and user space is where all your applications run. Now we can run many processes all at once, and it appears like magic, like we have many CPUs. So we're done with talking about multiprocessing. Let's return back to virtualization. So virtualization is basically simulating the hardware in software. This is the true definition of virtualization. Virtual means not real. Um, so virtualization is not real. The software and firmware is created um, uh, on the host hardware uh, on a system called the hypervisor, and sometimes called the virtual machine manager. <coughs> Paravirtualization is basically where hardware is not simulated, therefore it is less virtual. Most virtualization systems you're aware of are paravirtualization systems. But as long as you use the same hardware, virtualization works. I don't have to really go fast. Containers are Im an implementation of operating system level of virtualization, which is user space virtualization. Containers contain the application processes and subprocesses, but not the operating system. And that's key why containers are so fast, is because they're not swapping the operating system in and out. As long as you agree that you're going to use the same operating system, containerization works. But note that containers do not use hypervisors. And that might be the gist of the bigotry against containers, because most people think of hypervisors as virtualization, but I think I've shown otherwise. Great, thank you so much. So uh, the next person I'm going to invite up to speak is actually a celebrity. Um, she's been in the media recently as uh, one of the top five women in tech that are helping. Uh, what was the title again, sorry? A change, um, social change. <laughs> she's, she's actually been doing a really great job there. And I'm going to invite her up to speak. And uh, so give her a round of applause, please. I didn't say her name, but it's Elizabeth. She's so famous. I don't, I don't know how to use Windows. Woohoo. That, OK. <laughs> All right, um, I'm ready, yep. Uh, so I'm, my name is Elizabeth Joseph. I'm here to talk to you about a tool we use in the infrastructure team called Elastic Recheck. Um, so as you may know, uh, if you've contributed to OpenStack, um, any of your code needs to pass a bunch of automated tests to get into the repository. Um, this is really good because it ensures code consistency, code quality, and presumably when someone downloads DevStack, it's been tested and it actually works, um, the development version of OpenStack. Um, so that's great, yay. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, it doesn't always work quite like that. Uh, sometimes there are failures that have nothing to do with the code that you're actually um, uh, putting into the repository or proposing. Um, <laughs> uh, so sometimes there are failures. Um, there could be an upstream service outage. Uh, maybe the cloud can't contact the Ubuntu repository or something. Um, there may be an infrastructure problem. Those never happen, uh, or bugs. <laughs> Uh, OpenStack may actually have a bug that is only encountered every once in a while, so your test just happened to bump into the bug. Um, the test itself may have a bug, so your code should be passing the test, but something's wrong with the test itself. Um, there's also sometimes dependency issues. Um, now, for a long time, we didn't have a great view into this. Um, developers certainly knew when our tests were failing a lot, and we knew when the numbers were failing a lot, uh, but we decided that we needed some better view into why these things are failing. Uh, so, for a while we were depending on humans to tell us what the bugs were. Um, that didn't work so well because they just do recheck one, two, three, four, five as a bug number, <laughs> which is not helpful. Um, so we decided to make robots do it. Um, so Elastic Recheck is a project that is meant to uh, collect, organize, and detect failures that have been defined. So when there's a failure in the gate, and you think there shouldn't be, right, um, you have to wonder what happened there. So Elastic Recheck notices that there's been a failure, and it adds it to this website. I should have had a screenshot, um, but I don't. Um, it's just a website that has a web page that has a bunch of um, types of tests and then the things that have failed on them. So a developer comes along and looks at this uncategorized list and says, hey, this test is failing a lot, and these are all the, the reasons it's failing. Um, so what they do is they dig into those reviews, and they find out which, which ones of them are failing in the same exact way. Um, and by developers, I mean you, because we need more people working on this, and that's why I'm here talking about it. <laughs> um, so once a de developer finds a pattern that all these bugs have been, uh, or all these, all these reviews have been hitting, 
um, they create a bug report and link to the, the appropriate reviews. Um, we then have um, a uh, log stash cluster that we've put together um, that uses Elasticsearch and Kibana and the whole Elk stack um, to uh, collate all of our logs um, that we send to this thing. Um, so you know what the issue is, you know what logs it's referencing, so you go to log stash and you create a query. Um, that query is then put into the Elastic Recheck repository. Um, under a queries directory, and then you reference the bug name in the title. Um, this allows Elastic Recheck to then um, go and find the bugs and then report them back to, to the, the people submitting the reviews. Um, so Elastic Recheck looks at log stash, it monitors the logs, it makes sure it, it looks for the bugs. Um, and then when it finds a bug that has been reported in Elastic Recheck uh, repository, um, it leaves a comment in Garrett, uh, the code review system for the developer. So that's nice um, because it gives the developer a chance either to rerun the test, uh, knowing that it wasn't their change that caused the problem, and they know it's a known bug. Um, it was really, really frustrating for developers to have a failed test and not know why that failed and wonder, does anyone know about this problem? And a bunch of times we didn't know about it. Um, so now they have feedback when the Elastic Recheck bot comes in and says, hey, you hit this bug, sorry about that. Um, also, in a perfect world, this gives them the opportunity to help us fix that bug, um, which would be really nice if more people did. <laughs> um, they say, you hit this bug, you know, you can run recheck to, to rerun the tests, or you can maybe dig into it if you have expertise in that area and uh, help us fix the bug. Uh, and that was all I have about Elastic Recheck. Thank you very much, Elizabeth. So we have one more lightning talk presenter before we do the, the final draw for the last slate that I have here. And we're all going to head down to uh, enjoy the booths. They're going to have some lots of great food. And so for the folks who just joined, be sure to check out our booth. Uh, we're going to have a bunch of OpenStack and open source experts and uh, some free food and some free, I think it's champagne. So it should be a good time. So the next person that I'm going to ask to come up and speak and I know it's been a long day, so I appreciate you all sticking around, is uh, Spencer Crum. Which one's mine? <laughs> really? No, no, I really did. Was it by the deadline of Sunday? Yeah, it was like last week. Wait, seriously? You don't have mine? <laughs> no, you definitely did not send it up. Wow. <laughs> well, we're going to do this just for fun. Um, so what I want to talk about today is called synthesis. And so, no. And so there was this guy in uh, the 1800s in Germany called Hegel. And I was told about him in the 11th grade. And he had this idea about philosophy, and he was talking about synthesis, and he says that we come up with an idea, well, that's the thesis, and then in direct response to that idea, uh, the antithesis is generated, and these two things fight with each other to generate something called the synthesis, which is a new idea that's not either of the original two. And then the process repeats itself with the synthesis being the original thesis. You can point it at to something. Um, so what does that mean for us? Well. My name is Spencer Crum, and I work for Cody, and I work on something called Gozer, which is what happens when HP decides to bring in the open source, the OpenStack infrastructure project internally to HP. Um, and so we have this problem where we have a thesis, which is an upstream situation, and an antithesis, which is us trying to p bring it downstream, and we have to generate a synthesis. And so well, there's this file called layout.yaml, which exists, um, and it's essentially a list of all the projects in OpenStack and which tests to run against them. And so what we do with that, traditionally, is we keep, it's in, Git up, it's in Git upstream and then it's in Git downstream, and so we manage Git diffs and we merge against that. And that becomes a real pain in the butt when it becomes a thousand lines long and the diff itself is over 500. So what we'll do is we'll say, well, we know a few things about this file. We know that it has structure, we know that it's YAML, and it actually is just data. Furthermore, we can make some reasons. So when someone pushes a signed commit up to, uh, of say, Puppet Nova, or of, of Nova up, 
um, there's a job defined that will go ahead and package that up and send it up to PyPI. Well, we know downstream it doesn't make sense to run that ever. So what we can do is we can build a tool that processes the upstream config file, reads a config file of its own, and generates a YAML file for ourselves. So instead of simply taking a thesis, an antithesis, and generating a synthesis, we actually pop a layer of meta up and generate what we need to with tooling. And I think where that comes into play in um, OpenStack is if you're, if you're running, say you're, you're running a downstream heat, you're, running, you're packaging up heat and shipping it off to your, um, shipping it off to your, your customers, what you might want to do is instead of simply managing a diff, you, you could make a tool that grabs the heat source code and then applies function decorators to all of those functions and, keep the, and generates a new file and you ship that along with your own library that contains those decorators. So you can open up these, these functions and classes, change them to your needs without maintaining a giant diff against upstream. That's just an idea. I don't really recommend you do that. <laughs> But it, it's, a, it's a way to think about uh, synthesizing a new situation. Um, thank you. All right, thank you. Can I have B. Del Garby come up and pick from the box? Does everybody have one? Oh, and does everybody have a ticket already? I know some folks have, have came in and, and left. You need a ticket to win, so if you don't have one already, just raise your hands and uh, like you just don't care, and we'll bring you a ticket. It's okay. Oh, did you pick that? Do you want to read it out? Yeah, I can. Where's the number? Oh, you're at the top. So those are all in the box already? They're already in the box? Okay, so 0835790. Yes, no, maybe? Anybody get that? 0835790. Suckers. Take that one. Zero eight three seven five six three. Get it? Is that yours? <laughs> cool, cool. Thank you so much, Bidel. What's your name? Jan. Yeah. Jen? Yeah. Jan. Do you pronounce it Jan normally? Huh? What do you do? I'm uh, doing product management for uh, OpenStack at a small company in Vernon. Congratulations, you got yourself a tablet. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, everybody, for coming to the Lightning Talks today. Be sure to head down to the f floor number one, all the different booths. They have food and drink, and definitely be sure to ch check out the HP booth. We're going to have our HP experts there and get some cheese and champagne. And I just want to give Cody Somerville a huge round of applause. Can you guys give it up for Holly Vatter and Cody Somerville, who emceed this entire day for you? Thank you very much, Cody, and thank you, Holly.